Welcome, I am Frank Fagnone, President and CEO of Old Salem Museums and Gardens and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. And I'm here with Daniel Ackerman, who is Chief Curator of the entire organization. For Preservation Month, we're gonna be talking about different colors. And today's episode is about yellow. And Daniel, we've got a lot of yellow stuff surrounding us right now. I'd like to start with the room itself. Talk to me about why this room has this color and how did you determine? Yeah, so this room was built in the 1750s along the Meharan River in Eastern North Carolina. And when it was brought to the museum in the 1960s, it was basically a pile of parts. And so the first thing they did at that time was to look really closely at the surviving paint, carefully peel it back to what they thought was the original color, match it, to just a paint chip. Mm -hmm. And then when they reassembled the room, they repainted it that color, which at the time was this deep, dark tobacco spit brown color. But when we took a second look at some samples we were able to take back in the about 2010, mm -hmm. um, we were able to find samples that gave us the complete paint history for this room going back to its original coat. And it turned out it was this bright yellow color and it's become more scientific. And then what does scientific mean? Because I would imagine 10 years from now, there will be another way of analyzing um, historic paint. Yeah, so the way the science works right now is we take a small sample, we put it under a microscope, and we identify the pigments, the various uh, minerals and whatnot that are in the paint. And we also try to get to a place microscopically where we can see what those pigments look like mixed together in a location where they haven't been exposed to dirt and grime and air. And then that's what we ultimately match to whatever color we choose to put on the walls. This brings up a larger issue because I grew up with historic paint palettes like Colonial Williamsburg, Old Salem has its own palette. How authentic are those palettes? How do we know that those are in fact the actual colors that, for instance, this house would have been painted in? Yeah, I think oftentimes these paint palettes historically have reflected more about uh, the times we live in now than uh -huh. the times that we're trying to recreate, particularly in their emphasis of certain colors over other colors. But in a larger sense, they're also very much reflective of what people were seeing using that sort of scratch and match technique. Yeah. So generally speaking, those historic color palettes are going to be muted. They're going to reflect what historic paints look like after 200 years. We began to look more closely at the actual pigments that are being used and recognizing that those pigments, when mixed, provide usually a much more intense color. What we also realized was that the material those pigments were mixed with had a big effect. So paint, at its sort of simplest form, is pigment and a binder. So basically, raw ground pigment and something that's gonna stick it to a wall. And when you mix pigment into linseed oil, which is usually the binder, yeah. and you put it on a wall, it's really bright, it's really shiny. I mean, think, particularly when it's first applied, yeah. think high gloss paint. Shiny. Shiny. In a period without artificial light, you're trying to amplify the light you have. And so whether it's the ceramics or the furniture or the woodwork on the walls, you want to be reflecting back as much of that as possible. Now, what actually would have been the pigment that made yellow? So yellow in the 18th century is usually a pigment called yellow ochre, which is a, a yellowish iron oxide that has a lot of sort of clay and sand in it as well. So it's ground from it's stone. Ground from, it's ground from stone. And one of the things, for example, in this room where we actually used an 18th century paint recipe is that the surface is actually textured slightly. Um, it's not that perfect flat surface you would get if you just went to your local paint store today. Uh, it actually has a, a texture and a grit to it. You mentioned to me that the mixture of the paint itself, whoever mixed it, um, that that could slightly vary in its ultimate application, as opposed to what we're used to now when we buy a gallon of paint at a hardware store. 
Absolutely. So the paint is absolutely going to change over time, both because the person mixing it is sitting there with, you know, their various mixes of yellow ochre, titanium white, which we use to replace the white lead that would have been used historically, and other pigments, you know, they're going to get it as close as they can each time to whatever the reference sample is we want. But it's not the same as walking into a modern paint store where they've got a robot that can be super precise every <laughs> single time. Yeah, you know, I go into the hardware store and I look at the wall full of um, little color chips and it's a little overwhelming, yeah. right? I mean, in some ways it wasn't so overwhelming. You had certain minerals and materials that would give you certain colors and it was at least originally probably fairly simple. Yeah, and so, you know, depending on what you have on hand, you know, your, your big ability is to go between sort of more and less intense based on, you know, do you add more or less lead white? Yeah. Do you add more or less lamp black? You know, how you, how you adjust the proportion um, will certainly adjust the saturation and the overall tonality of it. And then again, with this linseed oil binder, it's going to be um, incredibly shiny. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly initially. Now, seven or eight years after doing this room, you can see it's sort of calmed down. It's still got a sheen to it, mm -hmm. but much less than it did right after it was painted. What's the difference between a glaze pigment and the pigment that we're talking about on the walls? These are both two examples of North Carolina earthenware, and earthenware is a fairly coarse bodied clay, not incredibly refined, and to make it watertight, you need to put glazes on it. And in particular, you use a lead glaze because that lead creates this sort of waterproof surface all over it. But underneath that glaze, you have various slip decorations, which are combinations of sort of a really wet liquidy clay mm -hmm. and oftentimes different chemical pigments that when introduced to the fire, all sorts of crazy chemistry happens and they change colors. At the time, you know, lead glaze allows you to create watertight earthenware vessels, but they knew in the 18th century, for example, that this sugar jar is fine for holding sugar, but what they would never put in a pot like this or a pitcher like this is something like, um, like vinegar. Because the vinegar, the, the, the acid in the vinegar is actually going to begin sort of leaching out the lead. So if you're talking about like food preservation, you're not using lead glazed earthenware, you're using usually a, a salt glazed stoneware. Now, I can remember when I was a little kid in art class and we're, we're painting on our pottery and I thought I had it all beautifully done. Um, and then it comes out of the kiln and the colors are not what I thought they were gonna be. It seems like paint color is pretty honest. Yeah. What you see is what you're gonna get. It will change over time, but that's not true with glazes. Even though you're using the same ground material, it's gonna change into a different color. Exactly, I mean, again, when you put something into a kiln at thousands of degrees, there are all sorts of chemical reactions happening. On the one hand, it means these glaze colors are pretty much permanent. I mean, they're very stable. They're incredibly this stable. This yellow is very stable as opposed to this paint, which will degrade over time. Exactly. Now, speaking about being unstable, talk to me about textiles, because here we have this beautiful chair in front of us with, I think, linen fabric, and it's yellow. What is the actual color that dyes the textile? So there are a couple of different things you can use. You can use the weld plant, uh, marigolds, turmeric, mm -hmm. like the spice. All of these things, just like they can you know, dye your shirt yellow uh, when you're eating them, they can also dye fabric. But you've got to take one more step when you dye fabric to keep it that way. You've got to fix it using um, a chemical process so that now the color is set into those fibers and isn't going anywhere, isn't going to wash out. But over time, because the pigment is organic, and the material the pigment is um, in is organic, you know, it's going to be incredibly unstable, particularly with, with light. Mm. Light is going to be the great enemy to colors and textiles. So, you know, for example, if, um, if this were an original 
yellow slip seat from the 18th century, the color we would see here on the top would be dramatically different from the color we would see if we just flipped it over. It's really interesting to think that color didn't exist in certain parts of the world because they didn't have those spices or plants um, or even stone or ground elements. Um, so it would seem to me that color is directly tied to trade. Absolutely. So color is a key way people are able to communicate about their wealth and status and their connections with the rest of the world. And that's particularly true with certain colors more than others. So for example, a really bright, vibrant blue in the 17th century on a painted wall is an incredibly rare and expensive thing. By the middle of the 18th century, because Prussian blue, a, a chemical blue has been developed, blue goes from being incredibly rare and expensive to being incredibly cheap and common. That's really um, amazing to me that it's tied directly to economics and consumption. Yellow seems to be like a workhorse color. It's not one of those really expensive ones. Is that true? Yeah, for the most part, this kind of a yellow is part of the, the sort of most common earth-based pigments. Um, which are, for the most part, based on iron oxides. And so they can run the gamut from this sort of yellow to oranges to browns to reds, you know, all depending on the exact uh, nature of the oxide um, as well as what else is added. And so as we walk through the galleries at Mesda, and I see different colors, they really are a kind of shorthand, a notation, for all kinds of cultural changes that are occurring. Absolutely, and they're all you know, meant to function en suite with the furniture, with the textiles. It's one big picture, which is one of the reasons why we do really try to think through our color choices, because it's part of this larger sort of decorative arts story we try to tell. So thank you for joining us for this episode of our series on color, pigment, paint, and preservation. This month, we're gonna be doing a series. Each episode will be a different color. And then also we'll be um, facilitating a special things episode online where we'll be talking about the relationship of nostalgia, imagination, and authenticity in color with historic preservation. So until next time, thank you and thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Frank.